Well, welcome to our seminar today by Professor Yuriki Banks. Uh, Professor Banks got an uh, undergraduate degree from the uh, Georg August Universität in Göttingen in physics. Then she obtained her PhD in uh, the Department of Engineering at the University of Cambridge in England. And after that, she joined uh, Granford Design as a consultant in the marketing area. Uh, from there, she was a research associate with Professor Mike Ashby, again at the University of Cambridge, who, um, of course, was the PhD advisor and, and uh, doctoral, uh, postdoctoral supervisor, also to Professor Foss, who's in our, our department here. Mm -hmm. um, later, uh, Ricky joined the Max Planck Institute for Metals Research in Stuttgart, where she was there for six years as a staff scientist. And since 2007, she's been in the uh, material science department at Drexel University. And she's going to talk to us today about ice-templated hybrid materials. So if you might be welcome to the Thanks. Thank you very much. Can you hear me? Yes. Thank you very much, first of all, for the very kind introduction and also for the invitation to come and speak here in the seminar series. I'm delighted uh, to be here, and I've already met with a number of faculty. It's been a most interesting morning. I would like to show you what we do in our lab, which we call the Biomimetics Design Lab at Drexel. So of course, a lot of the work has been done by the students, and I will show you what they look like at the end of the talk. Hybrid materials, I should explain, are materials they're composite materials very often, which also have an architecture and a structure. So just to, to start off with. You will probably wonder what my background is and where I come from with this research, how it all started. And it started really with the realization that most of our development here came, the human evolution and the technological advancement came actually with um, natural materials. The natural materials were dominating for a long, long time. This is Lucy. We don't know what the name of her friend is here, but Lucy lived about 3.3 .3 million years ago, and she probably had some twigs and some stones that she found around her, and nothing much happened in materials development, we think at least, until relatively recently. The skills with which they used what they had is remarkable. There were high-tech spears already 400,000 years ago. There were musical instruments already 40,000 years ago. Um, but then it becomes more and more interesting, um, but that is relatively recent. This is Etsy. Um, in Europe, he's called Etsy, or the uh, frozen Fritz, or the Iceman, found in an Austrian glacier. Um, he already had a very efficient U-bow, and the, he also had a copper axe. So at that time, about 5000 BC, technology starts to accelerate a little. But it's really remarkable for how long a time we were relying pretty much on what the environment provided us with. And so we have another acceleration here. About 200 years ago, we start to get interested in more and more different metals. And then uh, also, of course, then there's a revolution with the polymers that start to develop. And now we are uh, reducing the amount of metal usage again. And we're also rediscovering the biological materials because they're renewable and they offer as many opportunities that maybe some of the other materials that we've used for a long time don't so much. So as my PhD research, I was looking in the performance of material and how they compare and how we should select them. And the question was, can we select them like any other engineering material? So we started to plot property charts. And knowing who my PhD supervisor is, um, that's the reason, of course. So we plotted here specific modulus. The modulus divided by the density of the material against specific strengths, which is the strengths divided by the density of the material, to analyze how much energy a material stores, elastic energy. And my favorite material always comes up top in these charts. It's often bamboo. Like diamond in the other um, engineering materials is very often top. Bamboo comes often up. And uh, of course, you can see here also the Japanese archery bow is an engineering material like that. It is highly efficient in energy storage. 
as actually were the pole vaulting poles also, which were very initially made out of solid wood, later on out of bamboo. And I find it really remarkable. The last bamboo record was sustained until 1957. That, of course, is the era when fiber composites came into being, and they're actually a, a more controlled form of a bamboo. So the natural materials have actually taken us even into the century here. And when you look at your sports equipment with which you go skiing, then you see that primarily the good skis have a, still a wooden core. The snowboards are the same. Musical instruments also. So there must be something which is particular um, about these materials. And when you look, for example, at bamboo, of which there are about 1,300 different species, and there are always species which are particularly suited for a given application, you find that it is a combination not only of the material from which they are made, which is a cellulose-based composite material, but also how they're made up. So coming from top down, the, the bamboo grows as a tube. It has a hollow tube, which gives it efficiency. There's a property gradient. The fibers are unevenly distributed across the section. Each of these fibers is a bundle arrangement protecting the tubes which feed the plant. We have tubular fibers, um, highly elongated fiber bundles, and a Fermi matrix, which of course um, is another level of sophistication. Then we come down further, and each individual fiber is again a f uh, basically a plywood-like composite material. So high tech. This is why the materials are so efficient, because they have these hierarchical structures. And another thing that we are very interested in in material science always is to make materials better or to somehow beat what we consider sort of laws of addition. And very good examples for that is bamboo again. But when you look at it, and that's what I would like to explain with this slide, is that sometimes if you mix two materials, you don't end up with something which is sort of in the middle, but you can actually end up with something. So I'm mixing red and blue here to make a, a purple material. And the purple material is actually combining the, the strong properties of both materials. And that is something which we would like to achieve in a lot of the man-made materials. The biological world is sometimes more efficient and better in doing that than we are currently. And it is particularly important in the case of bone, for example, which takes advantage exactly of that. And wood and bamboo, I just plotted on here again because I just mentioned them before. Um, they also take advantage of these principles. And the idea is, again, that I'm combining not just materials, but I'm combining materials with specific architectures. That is key, and therefore, these purple materials are very often really hybrid materials, so composites with a structure. The hybrid materials are, in the case of bamboo, I showed it already, usually materials with hierarchy. Wood is exactly the same case. We come from meter length scale here, and we go down to the atomistic one where we have the sugar molecules that form the cellulose uh, backbone. And we can also look at bone and naka here, for example. I will talk a bit about biomaterials that we're trying to make by our freezing method. You look at these different levels of hierarchy, again, from the collagen molecule, which are combined into fibril, into fibers, into a larger structure, which ends in the Hervesian system. And in the case of NACA, where we have little mineral platelets that are joined by a polymeric phase in a brick and mortar like structure, which then overall give us a very high toughness. Um, bone also has a high toughness, of course, so that we don't break them all the time when we fall or stumble. The question in all these materials, when we look at them and analyze them and say, well, these natural materials are excellent. Um, how can we emulate that in a biomimetic way in the best sense of uh, an extraction of a principle of optimization? Um, then the question is, of course, also how do they differ from man-made materials or sort of synthesized materials? Is it really necessary to have all these different levels in those materials? Do we really need to somehow emulate the function of those? Or can I get away with less? We may never forget that the natural material is, of course, one which is formed by cells, small small little factories that make relatively large structures, whereas we in the technical world usually have relatively large factories to make relatively small materials. And so the question is really, does it, is it really necessary what I see? Do I need to apply all of that? And then the chemistry is a different one. The natural world operates at maybe room temperature or slightly elevated temperature, sometimes at lower temperatures. 
We, of course, can take advantage of much higher temperatures, a different chemistry. So the question is, what is what kind of a transfer from one into the other to make the best new material and uh, substitute for maybe a biological one? And of course, the question of substitution, material substitution, is one that makes us make biomaterials, where we try to substitute for a naturally grown tissue, a biological material, with one which we have made. And we find when we look at it, this is now a fracture toughness plot of, against Young's modulus here. When we compare this yellow bubble of mineralized tissues from the natural world, and we have a look at the materials which we currently use to substitute for these natural materials, which could be bone, for example, which could be the more trabecular cancellous bone, or to the uh, cortical, the dense bone up at the top here then we see that there is a big mismatch. Toughness is probably not so critical. A tougher material is not a disadvantage. The disadvantage is that the stiffness both of metals and also of ceramics is so much higher than the natural material that we are trying to replace. The effect that that has is that the implant carries load in a different way to the surrounding tissue. Bone, we know, needs to be stimulated in a particular way. It doesn't wish to be loaded too much. It doesn't wish to be loaded too little. And it means that we have some stress shielding, which ends in failure of the implant because the material is loosening and I have to replace it. I have to replace the implant. So the goal really is to bring the properties somehow into this region. And the question is also whether metals are really the best materials. For some applications, they probably are. But maybe can we make some materials which are more similar to the natural tissue? Their dream is, of course, always something that is replaced and regenerated, which is very indistinguishable in the end from what was originally there. So that is the goal. Make something more uh, mechanically compatible, particularly when we look at the Young's modulus here. And I was delighted um, to read that here in Dartmouth, there is a huge collection of um, extracted implants to have a look how they actually perform. Because that is something of which probably we take much too little advantage, that we really learn of the in-field performance of all that is put into the body. I learned from colleagues that very often the implants that are put into the patients are not so available after five years, after which one would know much better how they perform, but that already the next generation has been developed and is being marketed. And uh, so a lot of knowledge is actually not taken advantage of. So these long-term studies do not really happen. So I think when we look at the current biomaterials, they're both challenges and, of course, huge opportunities also. When we look at the implant statistics, um, there are 800,000 hip and knee implants in the US alone. So just in one country, 560,000 dental implants also in this country here annually. Um, of course, the implant fails, and it does unfortunately more than we would wish it to happen. Hip implants fail because there's infection, because of the stress shielding that I just explained, dislocation um, of the implant an uneven leg length that is generated because the implant is fixed in an unfortunate way, um, reactions to the debris that is formed of, due to wear, and there are failure rates up to 10% or over 10%. Also, dental implants have problems, infection, rejection, accelerated bone loss. And then, again, there's also not sufficient bone formation around the implant, which also means that they lose an end. Uh, they also lead to failure. But the performance there is a little better than in the case of hips. So the question is, how can we improve this? How can we make it sure that the implant is going to last maximum possible time? One opportunity is, of course, to build better life predictions of these with an implant registry or an extraction and uh, a study of what has worked and what hasn't in the past to put everybody, the whole industry together in a concerted effort. Of course, to make new and better implants, and we hope that we can do that a little bit with new materials also, in with which, and the, the other materials are important, to generate better interfaces between the synthetic and the natural tissue. So 
the in-blood registers, I think, were very important. And that is, um, when I looked into this, I found the statistics rather remarkable. Um, we do not know exactly how many of these numbers do actually fail. So this is why I had these rather vague numbers there. Because in the US, at least, there's no national database for those. They are not reported to the FDA. Other countries that have these registries, Australia, Canada, New Zealand, Sweden, are examples the UK also, have, with the help of such a registry, been able to reduce the failure tremendously. In Sweden, for example, it is only one third of that than in the US. So that is a dramatic uh, amount of less uh, of suffering of the individual patient, of course, and also of a healthcare cost. That is something which often goes down better with politicians. Then the surgeon knows much better what can be done well and what cannot be done well, on which I'm planning to choose, of course, and also whether a particular type is suitable for a particular situation, for example. The hope is then, of course, also that the manufacturers um, are on board in all of this. So if we want to improve it all, we have our register maybe in parallel. How can we make a better biomaterial? Well, one is really that two uh, parts come together here, that we have the biological and the medicine, medical side, meet with the material science and engineering side, um, because these really bring the different uh, amounts of knowledge and types of knowledge together. So we, we need um, in our new materials, which have to be made, molded, degraded, um, potentially with a certain porosity and surface properties, we need to know what else we can put in there in the form of bioactivity, maybe to inhibit immune or foreign body reaction, nutrients, growth factors. And so this is really a challenging requirement to make everybody talk to one another. And I think here at Dartmouth, that is um, a great environment and it seems that people talk to each other a lot. So communication between clinicians, biologists, material scientists, and engineers. And one statement of one of the NIDCR directors is the first two don't know what's technically possible and the latter two don't know the problems. Um, I think that um, so captures the image um, fairly. What we really want to have, something like a combinatorial material science, where we really combine the structure and the mechanical properties and the chemistry, where we have all these three cues to optimally um, perform and give us the optimal outcome. And then we come to materials which we find particularly promising. So scaffold architectures, we find, need to have already a certain structure. We want to have a mechanical response already. We want to have a structural um, cue for our tissue to regenerate. So we want to provide a matrix um, which has the right surface and the right topography and also the right chemical compounds. We want to add some signals which help additionally to these initial mechanical structure and chemical cues to regenerate. And we can that also do now, we know, with different spatial and temporal release patterns so that we don't have a burst in the beginning, but that we can prolong that a little bit. And then, of course, the dream is that we can already uh, fill these scaffolds with cells so that they're actually active, and potentially with the cells of the patient so that the immune reaction is minimized. So the question is, how can we make a scaffold of this type? And that is where our freeze casting starts. <coughs> We try to make hierarchically structured hybrid materials, so ideally uh, porous materials which have composite walls to try to combine as many as possible of these design requirements in one material. Freeze casting is really a form of directional solidification. We do that by having a liquid nitrogen reservoir by putting in a cold finger, which is basically just a copper rod, and on top of that, we put a mold, which we fill with our either polymer solution, ceramic suspension, metal slurry. And this bottom, oh, this mold has a bottom, which is also a copper plate, so that the cold finger can transmit the temperature, the, the heat, and uh, deduct the heat very easily from this mold. And then we start not really cooling it in a controlled way directly, but what we do is we basically warm our cold finger against the liquid nitrogen and stop warming it so that the cold finger cools down at a controlled rate. So we then have cooling rates typically in our lab between 0.1 to 10 centigrade per minute. And with that, we create structures. 
During the freezing process, ice crystals grow, they template our structure, and we have, depending on how quickly we freeze, different microstructures. So the principle is we have our polymer uh, solution ceramic slurry, ice crystals grow in it, ice likes to grow pure, all that is so suspended in it or dissolved in it is concentrated in between the ice crystals and we take our frozen good from the liquid to the solid, then we move it into a freeze drying piece of equipment, a lyophilizer, to sublime out the ice phase and we are left with a scaffold that has basically whatever dirt was in suspended or dissolved in it in the cell wall structure. Ice is a peculiar system. I just learned that it can also form pencils um, if you have the right pond and the right climatic conditions. But in our lab, we grew, grow ice crystals in the hexagonal form. And with the help of Ian Baker here, we definitely could confirm that this is what is happening, that the preferred direction of crystal growth is the 1, 1, minus uh, 0. I'm sorry for that mistake. Um, direction, so we have a plate-like structure. Ice is peculiar in that it forms much, or it grows much faster in plane, in the space plane, 100 times faster than in the direction perpendicular to that. And that means that we really have a, a relatively sheet light or, or cellular arrangement of the crystals here. In our cork that we have in our mold, that leads to different zones of crystallization. Initially, we have a dense zone of a lot of initial nuclei that form. We then go over into a more cellular structure in which these crystals start to overtake one another in preferred orientations. And then finally, we have very well aligned crystals along the thermal gradient of our freezing system. And it is particularly this lamellar zone in which we are interested for our materials. So when you look at that in an actual sample here, then you see there's this dense bottom zone. The crystals start to orient, parallelize more and more with the thermal gradient until you have a very homogeneous structure at the top. So it starts planar, then we have columnar growth, columnar to lamellar in transition, lamellar tilted, and then in the end, just the lamellar phase. A little bit is understood about the structure formation and how, for example, the thermal conductivity of the different components, like the liquid carrier, also the material that you suspend or dissolve in it, are going to affect the structure formation, the, how the plates are going to alternate, how thick they are going to be in the first growth. But we were very surprised um, that it's not really fully understood. We know a little bit uh, about the mullins sukerka instabilities, we know that particles interfere with the, uh, the freezing front that is formed in the material. But even there, the interaction of ice and the solution and the slur around it leaves a lot of research area open still for us to conduct. We know that, for example, the spacing between two lamella that form in the direction along the, of the growth is proportional to 1 over the velocity of this freezing front to the power of n and the power of 10 is from a half to about 1. Um, but that is only a certain amount of information that is helpful in the preparation of materials. We need to know much, much more. We know also in an empirical way that additives thrown in, for example, change the structure significantly. And that gives hope that we have actually a lot of tools to play with our structures and really custom design them for a particular application. And the applications are by no means only biomaterials. I mention a bit more about that um, a little later on. So because most of the people were freeze casting ceramics at the time when we started, we thought, let's try to see whether we can make a similar quality material and we built the equipment. Actually, it was a senior design student who built the equipment for us. And we made ceramics and ceramic composites by this method. And what we noticed was that really, as predicted, if you freeze slowly, the phase looks very different to one which is uh, freeze cast much faster, that if you throw in certain additives, you have smooth cell walls rather than rough ones, and that if you fill this material with the second phase and you crush it, you can achieve something which looks almost like NACA and has an incredible toughness. So that was the beginning. And then we looked at glycerol, sucrose, sodium chloride, and no additives. 
and learned that each of these really changed dramatically in which way obviously the water crystallizes because that is what forms the uh, pore structure here. How exactly that works, we do not know. Of course, that is one of the areas that we would like to explore a little more. And we started to study how different levels of our hierarchy here are influencing the mechanical performance because that is very important for us too. So to correlate the structure with the properties and of course also with the processing parameters that we use. So at the first level, we say we have porous materials. Watch how does the porosity influence the materials. And we look back at um, the papers of the Gibson Ashby model, who correlate performance of the foamed material, of the porous material, to those of the ingredients that were used. So these plots at the top here plot relative modulus against relative density. Here it's relative strength against the relative density. And we know from the model, which accurately describes both synthetic foams as well as natural foams like wood, for example, or a trabecular bone, that there are three important parameters that influence the properties ultimately. It's the relative density, how much material or how much porosity I have, whereas here the foam density is the density at the top divided by the density of the cell wool material itself. Then the solid of which, uh, from which this foam is made, of course. And then the topology or the connectivity and the shape of the porosity that we have in it. But what is very important is that we can distinguish between two principal different uh, types of foams. One is this bath type sponge foam, which is the one here at the bottom. It is an equiaxed foam. And then we have a honeycomb-like structure, which is very much aligned in its porosity. And we like to believe that our freeze cast materials are closer to the honeycomb structure, which has these better properties. When you look at the slopes here, you see that a, a honeycomb material decreases properties linearly only with a reduction in relative density, whereas a bath foam, bath sponge type foam reduces it quadratically. So when we look at the relative densities that our freeze cast materials typically have, that makes a difference of almost two magnitudes. So if we can make a material much stronger by using aligned porosity, because very often we have a preferred loading direction, this is a good way of doing it. In the strength case, it, the difference is maybe more of closer to a magnitude, to one magnitude. But similarly, this highly aligned honeycomb-like structure is clearly of benefit. So that gave us hope. And the first materials were made. And they behaved as we were hoping and we were predicting. Also, they were behaving like a proper foam. Some materials seemed to be crumbling more after the first uh, yield point was reached. Others had more of a yield point and seemed to perform more plastically. And we saw, well, there's room for improvement here. They, um, they're touching the foam-like structure, but of course we have a highly irregular structure. We have slight misalignment with the loading condition, so one wouldn't expect that we reach the ideal quite yet. On the left-hand side, you see ceramic composites, which have a higher density. They're about 90% in this case. On the right-hand side, you see the polymer foams, which perform a little better already in our comparison here. The G is gelatin, the C is chitosan. So we also make combos, and you see that you actually benefit also from making composites material there. OK. Then the next level of the hierarchy. So we have the porosity. But we said that, first of all, the porosity is important, the amount of porosity. The second level is how good is the wool structure? What, how, what are the properties of the wool material? And when you look at the cell wool structure and the cell wool material properties, you realize something very interesting that if you use the same recipe, the composition is the same, but you use either small particles, that's cuz, or you use large particles, which is cal, and a bimodal distribution of the particles here, then you get a very different response in the mechanical performance. So you can actually tune them through the sheer merit of choosing a particular particle size. Of course, you can tune a lot of other properties with that also, like, for example, the rate of dissolution of one phase over the other, or drug release, or things like that. So when you look at it, the least uh, strong is actually the small particle. The best is here the bimodal. And you can see 10 degree per minute, that is the freezing rate, is the best, because it has a finer structure, we think. 
But there are, again, two things coming together. There's also a slightly different aspect ratio in this structure. So that's something which we still need to investigate a little bit more. Then we looked at the failure modes. The, the small particle material failed in a very different way to the large particle material. And we were quite surprised that this would actually show up. The small particle material had a relatively uh, brittle response, whereas the large particle material had a much more ductile performance. And we believe that this is because here we have relatively little glue between the particles because we didn't change the overall particle uh, volume ratio to polymer ratio. And then here we really have more large particles that are strung up on a polymer string which allows it to perform much more plastically because the glue actually plays a much more important role still. Well, where are we with these first materials? Well, we're off the scale. <laughs> so more work needs to be done. <laughs> but this is a material which is just glued. And most of the materials that are currently being made use the freeze casting method and they center. What we also have is a relatively weak interface because it's not optimized yet. And the interface is going to make a large difference also in these materials. So we're very hopeful that we can bring it into the right range here, into the cancellous bone range that we need. And in fact, our first experiments with cardiosan and hydroxyapatite are rather promising in that respect. So there's another, so the large level, the porosity, then the cell wall level, and then of course the interface that we have in these. When we look at the importance of that, it's really astounding. And that is another research area that we've just started, actually. What happens if I'm filling my porosity with a second phase now? Can I make a material that, like the NACA, has this brick and mortar structure and has a toughness which is very high? And that actually works quite well. When you look at these plots here, you see that we have a weak interface material and a strong interface material. And you can see that they're several times the strength that you can achieve with this type of engineering. So by changing and tuning the interface properties, there's a lot of room for improvement. And in the strength, um, there's always a certain amount of improvement. But where it really shows is where the fracture toughness plays a role. So by being able to tune the interface properties between these two materials, we really have a good chance of making the material much better. So we know that the interfacial strength controls, which can be controlled by grafting or some addition so that we actually have a little layer of a, another material between them, um, we can control strength and toughness. And that we, so far, um, see highest toughness with strong interfaces in a brick and mortar structure, just like the one that the natural system has in NACA. Um, the higher toughness we want in a biomaterial, high strength is very good too, but most important is, of course, the damage tolerance. Yes? What do you mean by interface? Interface is the joint between, in this case, for example, the porous scaffold and the material that we've infiltrated in. So if the porous scaffold is a metal, for example, and we're infiltrated with a polymer, where these two materials join, that is our interface. And one could, in addition, put another material in there, which would be almost like an interface with pH, which could also help to join the two together. So there's a lot of uh, possibility there. And here you see that, for example, a combination of alumina with PMMA, so infiltrating an alumina structure like this one with PMMA, you move, the again, the specific toughness from a combination of these over by not quite a magnitude, but by, a, a, let's say, a factor of, of eight or so. So that is one of the directions we want to go in our research uh, and continue to the with new system. And when we started with this around us, we thought, well, we know we can do materials, um, and they, they're starting to turn out well. Very few people we noted had worked on metals made with this method. So we thought, that's a nice niche. Let's start and see what we can do in that area. So we started freeze casting metals. And these metals have the same structure, again, as the ceramics that I showed you before. We have this highly aligned porosity in the longitudinal direction. And across, we have here a structure which has these little cells with elongated pores, because that is the prime way that these crystals grow. We center the material, and then we have pretty dense cell walls. And 
we see that we can measure, of course, these dimensions, and the hope is in the long term that we can get really rigorous correlations between such features here and the material performance. But what we also noticed was that we can really take advantage of additives again. So by taking ethanol, for example, we can control the amount of wall material that we have, because if we don't add it, we have relatively large amounts of relatively thin walls. If we add the ethanol, we have larger pores and much thicker cell walls. And of course, that allows us for the same relative density to tune the material again. That is also important if you want to fill the structure with another phase, because with this, you'd also tune the amount of surface area, the amount of interfacial area, with which we can again tune also the overall performance of our material. We are freezing metal powder suspended in a polymer with a little bit of polymer binder. So we're still working in a water-based slurry, which contains metal particles, a certain amount of a polymeric binder, which is burnt off during the sinter process. Are you using the ice now? It is still ice templated. This is all still ice templated. So instead of just using a ceramic powder in our slurry, we now use a metal powder in our slurry. And when you look at it in 3D, uh, you see that the structure has this line porosity that you just saw before. And also how much we can tune not only the lamellar spacing, but the whole uh, shape and the size of the pores, which is very important for the bimaterial. Of course, the metals have a clear yield strength here, and otherwise have the typical stress strain performance of a foam again. And then we found that we had to be a little disappointed because the stiffness of these materials is very low, surprisingly low. It didn't fit quite into the equation that we were hoping for. And when you plot the yield stiff against the Young's modulus, again, you can see you can tune the properties by the sheer merit of using, well, a smaller concentration, yes, but then also by the, the way you shape those cell structures. You can uh, more than double the properties. But we felt they were falling quite short of our slope two line here. So we were looking at it and were wondering what is happening. The cell wall material is so thin, it buckles. It's not actually supporting the load by a, a real loading um, cross-sectional area on which um, the honeycomb structure certainly relies or some more clever bending mode. But it is buckling. We think it is buckling. So. That is not so bad, as we will see in a minute. The strength is a little bit better in these materials. In fact, when we look and plot how these materials compare to our cancellous burn, for which they could, for example, be a material, then we see that we are in the right range. We are a little stronger, but the stiffness is right. And since we said stiffness is so important, this seemed to be very promising. So why did we start with steel? Because we could find powder small enough for our freeze casting method. We are relying on powders that do not sediment during the freezing process. So in the meantime, we found powder, titanium powder, small enough so that we can now make biomaterials from titanium or titanium 6-4, which are the alloys which are really preferred. And the structures look quite similar um, when you make them. Um, we are still working on the sintering a bit. But there is definitely great potential there. And we are in the right range of the properties. Then we thought, OK, so metals, ceramics work. What about polymers? What is actually happening when we do this freeze casting? And there was, again, remarkably little to be found. I found then, in the end, a paper from 1980, which was forgotten. Nobody cites it, unfortunately, because it's, um, it's the beginning of a series of three rather good papers, which also looks a little bit in the whole science, the fundamentals of the freezing there. And the freeze cast polymers show really something very unique. So we thought, which material should we start off with? And we started with a material which, which had worked in a natural form again. So this was a bio-inspired. Um, and it's true. That I'm not making up this story. It's, it's really true that this is the sequence of events. I had started to study insect cuticle in an earlier life. And we had investigated leaf locus which procreate at a very high rate, as you can see. 
and they also therefore deforest North Africa at regular intervals. They, you know the stories from biblical proportions. The way or the reason that they can do it is also because they have very, very efficient cutting tools. These cutting tools have something which is very peculiar. They are zinc enriched. It's not really zinc particles in them, but they're zinc in them, full weight percent roughly. And it is probably ionically bound. How exactly nobody knows. There are several very clever groups working on this. Um, but it has not been completely cleared. But we know that we have very sharp cutting tools here, which are self-sharpening, which are wear resistant. They have to mold and replace them every few weeks, of course. But this is the extreme end of the properties that you can achieve with chitin, a chitin fiber, which is embedded in a protein matrix. And depending what kind of properties you need, the insect has on its exoskeleton, all of which is found by this chitin composite material, either a very, very sharp cutting tool here, a wear resistant cutting tool, or an eye, or a membrane with which it can deform, or a membrane with, with which it can fly, or a gecko-like hairy attachment system. So it seemed to be a rather versatile material which is open to tuning. And when you again plot one of those property charts, Young's modulus against density in this case, that you can see that chitin and chitin composites with a protein matrix, for example, can be tuned over about eight magnitudes. So we thought, well, if this can happen in nature, that's a great system to work with also for biomaterial. So the chitosan can be uh, manipulated a little bit. It is deacetylated chitin. It can be dissolved in pH in weak acids. We use acetic acids. Our material always smells a little like vinegar for that reason. And it is enzymatically degradable. It is bioresorbable. And it can be functionalized with growth factors. It's also attractive from a mechanical perspective, because as you saw before, by just fine tuning the cross-linking, I can really increase the range of properties dramatically. And then we started freezing the polymers. And we thought, well, let's mix in a little bit of gelatin, because a lot of people are interested in gelatin scaffolds. And we noticed that. If we moved from chitosan here to a high concentration of gelatin, we were changing the pore structure again, and gelatin is a gel. So that is changing um, not only the structure, but then also the properties that we find in these materials. So the more gelatin we have, the higher properties. And that is actually an increase which is beyond what one would expect by a rule of mixture approach um, that reflects also the structural changes here into a smaller, more uh, rounded cell here. So we were encouraged. And then the students who were making these materials were in the lab and came back and said, hmm, somehow we see features which are smaller than the pore sizes. First we thought these are actually the ribs between pores, and then realized these are not um, the pore sizes. But the pore diameters were between 20 to 200 in the short dimension and a couple of hundred in the long dimension. The pore length, of course, is either several millimeters or even several tens of milliliters, uh, millimeters, the length of our freeze cast sample. And then they took it under the SEM and saw this. Fantastic ridges. And we got very excited. We had just spoken to colleagues who were working on spinal cord repair and peripheral nerve scaffolds. And they had asked us, can you make a polymer scaffold that helps align accents when they regrow? We said, well, we have some very nice looking structures here. Maybe we should try them out. And that's exactly what they did. So the students said, well, we also need to know a little bit about the mechanical properties. The spinal cord, for example, which is um, the, the inner part here, the, the gray matter, which is of particular importance, has the consistency of about mayonnaise squirted from a tube. So it has a, a low kilopascal range in modulus. And the peripheral nerve, um, that sort of property range is fine for that too. The idea is to bridge the ends of, um, of a damaged nerve and to make sure that you afford the nerve ends with a structure that helps them to align again and to make connections again so that they, they meet up. A problem is scar formation, for example, and once that has formed, one really needs to clean off the ends again to, to help that junction. So having scar formation, one could functionalize the ends of a scaffold, for example, to prevent that from happening. But the idea is primarily make something travel in a directed way. If you don't give a direction, these ends go haywire. They go anywhere. So we felt that the design requirements for these scaffolds were an aligned porosity and a Young's modulus of about 3 to 5 kilopascals. 
and that we could probably make that either from the gelatin that we've started to work with or the chitosan, and we noticed that actually wet chitosan had just the right properties. So property control, of course, composition was another option, degree of cross-linking. We are also playing with a cross-linker here. And then the students peeled off individual layers to see what was going to happen. This is one of those layers again. And put dorsal root ganglia on there, so these are blobs of many, many cells that from which the accents grow again. And we were literally jumping up and down in the corridor when the students said, look, <laughs> this is what it looks like. So the alignment is really working extremely well. And we felt that the control, for example, this is a, a dorsal root ganglia sitting partially on one of our scaffolds and partially on a glass slide. You see where the glass slide is, where there's no structure. It just grows randomly where as soon as you give it a guidance, it grows along these little ridges here, the same, the control on the pure glass slide, even where you end up with something or start off with something which is perpendicular to the groove directions they bend on and align. Or the same when you look at individual uh, new rights growing here, they really align very, very nicely with these ridges or the pores. So we are very excited of this, of course, and these are probably the most spectacular pictures that we have to date. Raises the question, where do these ridges come from? That is, we don't quite understand how that is working quite yet. And when we look in the literature, we find that most other groups are doing what we are doing. They work with empirical results to date. And these raise many, many questions. For example, can we say that our polymer solution um, is templated with a grown crystal which then have protuberances. They have maybe uh, another crystal layer as a ridge growing in parallel to the thicker plate. Um, the vertical direction being temperature controlled, the transverse direction being concentration controlled. Um, that they then template our ridges on the polymer. And can we control this better with additives? How do composition processing, processing parameters like the freezing rate correlate, for example? Because we know it is highly freezing rate dependent. If we freeze too slowly, if we freeze too quickly, these ridges don't form. If we use the wrong concentration, the ridges don't form either. So there's something interesting going on. Um, then the other question is, we notice that materials which have these ridges have better stiffness, because they are rib stiffened, effectively. Each lamella is rib stiffened. Um, so there are a lot of open questions that we would like to answer. And the ice lab here is, of course, a fantastic uh, place to work and to do that. So it is, in a way, there are many, many questions. And that's almost surprising, because the first papers um, about the fundamental science of phase separation in these polymers date back to at least 1908. And I'm showing two papers here, because Herr Lottermoser says, writes to Herr Bobatag here, you may have overlooked my earlier publication. <laughs> um, can you imagine writing a paper like that today in the community, which is so much larger, um, in which I already described what you mentioned in your paper, basically. So um, we, surprisingly little is known, despite a very, very long history here. We really want to understand better what is happening during the freezing process. And also because we depend on two drying steps. So unlike metals where you have a, so, uh, a liquid and then a solid phase, we have something which goes from liquid to highly concentrated, more viscous, to something which is then glassy, a very different way of forming a solid um, that we really need to understand both the drying that happens during the freezing process and then also the drying that happens through the lyophilization uh, process. And we have started with one of the big problems. If I want to know what is happening in a metal um, solidification case, I go to a book and I find a phase diagram. So it's a pretty straightforward thing. We stand on a lot of giants there who have done a lot of hard work for us. We have been looking desperately. And if anybody of you knows the source for chitosan, alginate, agar, agar, any biopolymer or any other polymer phase diagram that has been properly measured, please let me know. We cannot find them. So what we really will need to start off with is to learn the phase, not really the phase even, but a state diagram that tells us what phase changes we have. Because we have ice as a solution, then we have a supersaturated solution until we reach the glassy point. Um, we know from food chemistry, there's a very good uh, food chem uh, chemistry book by Fenema, that also the freezing rate tells us how much 
of the moisture that was originally in our polymer is retained um, during the first step and then also the lyophilization step. So there are a lot of question marks and we really are lacking the very, very basic knowledge that we need to answer those questions and that's what we hope to uh, do next. Our dream, the big goal, rigorous structure property processing correlations and of course you have seen I like maps too. Um, I started learning about them and I just find they're extremely useful in depicting correlations and memorizing also what these correlations are. So the ideal would be to have a map like this, for example, where we can plot the freezing front velocity against the temperature gradient at this front and then say, well, in certain conditions we have thick smooth lamellae, maybe thinner smooth lamellae, and then we have summer ridges and then we go back to our thinner but smooth lamellae. And ideally, of course, we would like to continue this um, so that we can also correlate these pieces of information then with the structure and, and so really pool sizes, aspect ratios, and things like that, and the mechanical performance that go with them. So that is the dream. And these are is my great team. I'm very proud of my students. They're, they're really excellent, who are helping to make it all possible, and on whom I'm betting a little bit also to achieve some, to answer some of these questions at least. So I would like very much to thank them, all of those who are depicted. In the meantime, we have a couple of extra students that we need to photograph too. And also, of course, all the funding bodies that um, entrust us with a fair bit of taxpayers' money, like NEUP, the nuclear energy program, our steel scaffolds, for example, are also being scaffolds for nuclear um, uh, fuel pellets that we're trying to engineer with them to make the nuclear fuel a little bit more efficient to have higher burn-up rates and maybe also to have a better waste disposal. NSF, um, who are funding us for some bone research, the National Institutes of Health, also through a program in which we develop nanocomposites by freeze casting. And then the Army Research Office also, with, who are funding research on the fundamentals of the interface property, for example, who are funding us. So with that, I would like to come finish and thank you very much indeed for your attention. Thank you. They do. Um, you can do the same thing with comfine, for example, which we have tried. Comfine does the same thing, only at a higher temperature. Comfine, naphthalene, the other organic solvents, for example, that would allow us to do similar things. The attraction of the water base is that it is so benign. In our lab, you can, well, you, know, you don't want to eat steel, maybe, but you could, in principle, eat the material that we are using, or large ones. And it's very cheap, yes. But we also know that other solvents will result in different crystal structures and therefore with different structures. And we may venture out into that much more. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yes. That is a very interesting question. I have not come across those structures, but I will now start actively looking for them. I, I know that we can learn a lot about um, the behavior of cells that are subjected to freezing. And of course, one dream would be, couldn't we fill the whole thing and have something like a, an off-the-shelf product? But that's the, there are various problems with that. You have little ice crystals potentially growing. So there are, of course, the antifreeze proteins that the natural world uses to prevent that from happening. Some creatures can allow themselves to dry out rather dramatically, and they can still come back to life. And um, research is going on in those areas, and we hope that we may benefit from that too in the future. But that's a very good idea. So <laughs> I don't know when... Yes, yes. This slide, we worked on nutshells. 
and did tomography on different types of nutshells because they turned out to have very, very different types of porosity. And we were hoping that we could learn structural property correlations through nutshells. And one of the seeds that we also looked into was a, a, ficus, a, a fig tree seed here. So this is only part of it. This is the outer shell. And this is the inner part of it, um, which contains the nutrients. And this is actually quite a sad picture in the meantime, because we did this quite a few years ago. And the student was manipulating the data and made it look beautiful. And all of a sudden, he came and said, you have to have a look at this. And there was this eye. Um, and in the meantime, we found out somebody published a science paper with exactly those structures. Only we had no clue that we'd seen something that people hadn't seen before. We saw that it's just pretty. And not having shown it to a biologist, um, the novelty that these are actually channels with which um, moisture and, of course, um, oxygen can diffuse in and out of the seed shell to make it germinate um, was something that, well, didn't quite occur to us. <laughs> so it's good to talk very interdisciplinary about any picture that you would generate, I think, with students. <laughs> No, but, uh, yeah, so this is um, a little bit of an accident uh, with a um, thick tree seed. One more question. On the relationship between the baking between the plate and the seed, where is the tree and the baking? How sensitive is that function to the actual chemistry of the tree? That is also something, it is sensitive to that, but it is sensitive to that because when, for example, you put in ethanol, into the water, then the lamellae increase uh, double the thickness, roughly. And I wish I could tell you why that is. There is certainly a freezing point depression that has taken place, but we didn't understand it well enough that I would dare to really be able to say we know. Mm. But that's the exciting thing we have to do now. <laughs> one more question. 